Hello all, Rick here and I'm going to explode. Nothing quite says imminent destruction than hearing the main engineer call up to the captain that there's about to be a warp core breach. It happens quite a lot in Star Trek. Warp core containment failing, antimatter reserves being rendered inert, dilithium crystals fracturing, coolant leaks and so on. But what are all of these disasters and how does a warp core breach unfold? Well, from start to finish, let's take a look. In essence, a warp core is two tubes that meet at a reactor. One supplies matter in the form of deuterium, the other in antimatter as anti-deuterium. In the middle, there is an assembly that contains a dilithium crystal, among lots of other tech, that regulates the annihilation interaction between the matter and antimatter. This energy is then imparted into a plasma flow with a subspace signature, which is then carried out of the warp core and pumped through the vessel, primarily to the nacelles which then use the plasma to energise and form a warp bubble using the massive warp coils. I'll drop relevant links below to other warp core related topics I've covered, but with all the basics explored, let's see how to break it. Editing Rick here, just adding that I'm aware that in technical manual descriptions it also says that the electroplasma is formed within the warp core and that extracted energy is warp plasma but having it formed entirely within the core seems to contradict some other events, so I'm just going to chalk it up to different cores having different designs. Just wanted to highlight that yes, I am aware of this additional apocryphal factoid. On with the video. The first problem that we can encounter is that antimatter loves to destroy matter it comes in contact with, causing both to cease to exist and convert into energy. Great for energy production, but bad for trying to contain it. For this reason, antimatter storage is a massive deal on starships, and the vacuumous antimatter containment pods are laced with magnets to make sure that the antimatter literally never even touches the sides. Most of these pods not only run off the main power, but contain their own backup power sources that can last for hundreds of years. Even smaller storage pods, made for transfer, have their own miniature forms of this. Overall, outside of damage, this is the least likely point in a disaster for something to occur, as once contained, there are all sorts of countermeasures. On top of this, there do exist technologies within Star Trek that can neutralise antimatter, effectively draining the reserves. Although whenever we see this it tends to be an undesired outcome, Starfleet could still theoretically do this to their own supply in an emergency. Finally, the antimatter storage can be vented into space, but you'd have to be careful where this occurs and that the ship is not going to drift into its own cloud. Or even that the cloud will fall onto something else. Unlike deuterium, the antimatter reserves on the starship are generally manufactured from the matter counterpart in some conversion process, so they can always make more, it just takes time, and emergency power to get production back online again. So, the next point of failure is when the antimatter is conveyed from the storage to the warp core for use. Along its travel, the same magnetic containment rules apply, keeping the particles centred in an antimatter stream away from interacting with the very conduit in which they run. In an emergency, these streams can be shut off and the conduits emptied, lessening the chance of accidental interaction. However, if one of these conduits was breached at any time while running, you're going to have a few seconds of leaking antimatter that begins to annihilate on contact with anything and an explosion. At this stage, it's not made it to the warp core yet, so it could potentially be survivable but crippling. So when it makes it to the core and the reaction starts, this is where there are multiple things that could go wrong, and is therefore the most monitored part with numerous failsafes. A containment failure is one of the primary concerns. This is when that system of electromagnets is interrupted around the warp core itself, and we see the same effect as before, only this time the chances of the anti-deuterium mixing with its refined deuterium counterpart is much higher, as they are in closer proximity, and if this happens, then you're going to get a much larger explosion. What begins as a slight containment fluctuation could escalate into a small sample brushing against one of the walls of the core, making a breach, which damages the rest of the core, leading to more failures, more contact until the matter and antimatter finds each other and reacts and just… it goes outside of the intermix chamber where we want them to meet. Failsafes to prevent this are more limited, as once the antimatter is in the core, it cannot be vented. 
The first safety feature is the continual observation and monitoring from both crew and automated systems. Every fluctuation and deviation is logged, and anything beyond established parameters triggers an alert. Engineers can work to adjust containment and compensate alongside the main computer. However, if this fails, then the warp core can be cut off from its supply, an emergency shutdown. But if there's not enough time, then the ship is forced to eject the warp core, dropping it from a hatch, usually on the underside of the vessel, and the core either sorts itself out or detonates, hopefully at a safe distance. The core still maintains its own automated systems that will attempt to stabilise it, but if not, larger starships also carry a backup warp core which is then installed, but that's a lengthy process. Containment failures are by far the most pressing concern, as not only can internal errors cause this, but external factors beyond the control of the crew. Ion storms, subspace effects, anti-neutrinos and other strange phenomena can have adverse effects on magnetic fields, and if the vessel cannot compensate, then shutting down the core might be the only option for safety, which can take up to a week to reinitialize. To give you an idea at the level at which containment is reinforced, however, a galaxy-class starship would only fail when containment dropped below 15% meaning that there is an 85% margin of redundancy and wiggle room. A burst warp plasma conduit can also prove to be damaging, however, the casings of warp cores are built to withstand much higher temperatures than simple plasma. The plasma itself would melt most things, certainly organics, but the core itself is unlikely to be damaged. An engine room being filled with plasma is more of a hazard to the engineers than the equipment, so evacuation in the face of a plasma leak is needed. Both physical shutters and force fields can be used to contain the roiling plasma, and the engineering chamber can be vented through environmental controls. Plasma leaks can also happen elsewhere on a starship, wherever there's a conduit that could be ruptured due to an overload or damage. An exception to this is if contaminated plasma is fed into the warp core, such as containing viridium isotopes. This contaminated mixture reacts poorly and can lead to a destabilised reaction, risking the core. Inbuilt magnetic constrictors are generally responsible for regulating the flow of plasma into the core, and if these are damaged, the plasma flow can also be compromised, resulting in issues within the core. At all of these intake points, however, things can be shut off quickly to protect the reaction chamber. A coolant leak is another concern. The matter and antimatter reaction generates a lot of power, and also heat. The warp core is rated to be able to withstand such temperatures for a while, but such interactions exceed even that of plasma's temperatures. For this, the warp core needs to receive a constant supply of coolant to offset the reaction. A coolant leak, however, jeopardises this stasis. Not only is the coolant itself corrosive to organic matter, but without cooling the core will begin to overheat. Once more, the failsafe here is an automated or triggered emergency shutdown, and is in fact part of the same safety system that limits high warp travel. Most Starfleet ships have a maximum safe speed and an emergency factor that they can reach for around 12 hours before the core gets too hot and has to be shut down. Exceeding this time limit begins to risk the safety of the vessel, and continual acceleration beyond the red line will snowball into the core overloading and breaching. Again, external factors may also play a part here, with a warp core being forced to run at a higher output than expected, to say, escape a subspace eddy or something. In addition to this, channeling excess power into the core from other sources can also trigger shutdowns or breaches. The least likely event of a warp core breach is also the most obvious one, physically damaging the core's integrity. So this is more of a matter of prevention than cure, as not only is Intermixed Chamber incredibly robust, it also has a force field that can be triggered for protection. However, this is not always on, and there are plenty of weapons in Star Trek that can break through even a warp core's casing. In this case, well, just don't let someone with a phaser near an unprotected active warp core. But again, this is actually the least likely to happen. In most of these situations, if correction is not possible, then an emergency shutdown is the second point of call. 
followed by an emergency ejection. Finally, the most dire situation is if the emergency ejection system does not function. This can be caused not only by mechanical damage, but if something, hardware or software related, will not disengage the supply of antimatter, matter, coolant or warp plasma to the core. All of these pumps need to be turned off before the core can be removed, otherwise, well, obviously it would be bad. If these fail to disengage, then the core won't eject, especially if it's the antimatter valves. Flooding engineering with antimatter is going to result in a 100% antimatter explosion, and dealing with a critical core is at least preferable to certain death. There are also a large number of creative workarounds that Starfleet has come up with, including channeling the excess energy out through the main deflector until the warp core runs itself dry. Just as creative in fixing potential core breaches, there are the list of sabotages that can occur. One of the earliest was witnessed in 2154 on the NX-01, where the antimatter flow regulators were sabotaged with codes that prevented them from decreasing their current. This means that if the Enterprise attempted to slow down from warp, the core would still be receiving excessive antimatter, now with nowhere to channel it, and breach. And of course, there was the infamous burn, which, causes aside, saw the dilithium itself lose its subspace connection, therefore preventing it from effectively channeling the antimatter reaction, reducing it to a salt lamp. This caused the entire warp core to suddenly just collide matter and antimatter with no regulation or channeling and boom. An actual warp core breach is far more serious than containment issues, as usually the breach has happened because none of the countermeasures stopped it, and by this time it's a lost cause. In the final safety feature, source of separation is often quicker than full evacuation procedures, but escape pods and shuttlecraft are there for exactly this sort of scenario, and not every vessel can separate, although it's more than you might think. An exception to these breaches are microfractures, which are small enough that the magnetic constrictors can be used to divert any particles inside the core away from the fracture, holding it at bay until it's repaired. One of the biggest concerns are tachyons caused by cloaking, folding spacetime, or time travel. They tend to pass through a lot of matter, and also interact badly with the subspace elements of a warp core's intermixed chamber, which can lead to a sudden destabilization that also risks a core breach, although they would have to be in very high quantities and are often detectable on sensors beforehand. Finally, if the warp nacelles of a vessel are catastrophically damaged, there can be a feedback event which can make its way back to the core, and then we have a similar outcome as to an overload. This is actually incredibly rare, as most of the time any such backdraft of energy is unlikely unless major structural damage has happened, and the nacelles could not be shut off completely. So, that about covers the most common events that can lead to a warp core breach. At the heart of it all, however, are the team of engineers that monitor, maintain and devise countermeasures to most of these problems, let alone the myriad of safety features and workarounds that already exist. The most common warp core breaches are generally those resulting from overwhelming damage, like if the ship was destroyed anyway from something else, and even in this case, last minute automated procedures tend to isolate the core with the ship's last dying breath to limit the inevitable explosion. Last thing you want is your ship going down and taking out your entire fleet with it. That last justifier is the reason starship explosions are not as large as they should be with the levels of power at play in warp cores. A realistic warp core event would be more like a radiation burst. Now, the real reason we see starships explode is that it looks cooler and allows for ships to fly and battle near to one another in combat scenes. Thanks for watching this video on warp core breaches. I've been Rick, and until the next one, thanks again, and goodbye.